Um, I hope you're all sitting comfortably because today we're going to unpack an interesting topic. Do Malaysians care about farmed animals? So this is to discover effective vegan advocacy in Malaysia. The premise of this topic is it's based on one of last year's AAA forum findings, whereby veganism as an advocacy movement in Malaysia is lacking legitimization and is commonly seen as a dietary practice rather than an animal rights movement. So we're hoping to discover effective vegan advocacy in Malaysia by learning about current advocacy approaches from these speakers that you're seeing on here and um, to uh, to learn about like the current advocacy approaches, what we hope to achieve in Malaysian context and what other ways we can do to strengthen the animal justice movement in Malaysia. So before we get to know our speakers, I'd like to ask you beautiful audience a question. Um, so there will be a poll. Uh, the trunk can put up the poll now. So just wanted to uh, know what you think, like uh, which advocacy approach is the most effective to encourage Malaysians to go vegan. So yeah, I just want to gauge your perspective on this before we start. Is the poll up? I can't even see a thing. Uh, some someone locked in with a a, a cam. Okay. Wait, what? Yeah. Are you in control? Yeah. I see. Should I, I launch I, it? I, I seem I, to have control oh, for some reason. I see. I see. <laughs> Wait a minute. I will. Wait a minute. Tech issue. Oh, I can also see it. Yeah, Do you want me to launch the poll? Right. Okay, I'll, I'll just launch the poll then. Is that okay, Trump? Yeah, you can launch it from the side. Okay. Cool. Ah, nice. Okay, so yeah, this is the first poll. Uh, so yeah, which advocacy approach is most effective to encourage Malaysians to go vegan? I just want to know what you think. We'll just give a minute for people to answer. Oh, I see. I see the poll running. Ooh. Awesome. Interesting. Nice. Can they answer multiple times? Okay, multiple choice hmm interesting cool cool okay i think it seems that everyone says answered it's not moving anymore okay last call last call and should i end it and okay <laughs> wait share results am i sharing okay so apparently food and health dietary and environmental stance climate crisis is seems to be the most effective based on people's opinions so that's interesting this political stance and then animal liberation cool Okay, we'll see how the opinions might change towards the end. Okay, cool. I guess we're done with that. And yeah, um, so yeah, to liven up this discussion, we have three amazing speakers who are vegan advocates in Malaysia. I'll let them introduce themselves. So um, let's start. Shall we start with Ratna? Are you okay? Okay. Sure. Yeah, tell us a bit about yourself, uh, organizations you're affiliated with, uh, your vegan advocacy method and experience, and maybe how people's reactions have been. So, yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. It's going to be a lot. So It's okay, you have time. Uh, <laughs> really? Okay, can we extend? <laughs> so anyways, Davina <laughs> uh, <laughs> is okay with it. So, anyways, uh, I started 14 years ago becoming a vegan. As soon as I heard about what happens in the dairy industry, the egg industry, and how in these industries, well, you know, the people don't kill the animals by eating them. By the industries existing, all the animals in the industry are killed. All right. So, 
back then there was no vegan groups on Facebook. There was no activism whatsoever. All right. So we started with a vegan group. We started activism. We did events. Uh, of course, Diana is aware of it. Uh, we did like events with Free Friends Farm and Animal Sanctuary. Uh, we even did events in hotels and things like that. So, um, so at the end of those events, we realized that it wasn't working. Food-based approach or talking about the environment to promote veganism doesn't work because what is veganism? It's about the animals. It's an animal liberation movement. It's not about health. I mean, health has its place. Environment is important, but there are separate movements for them. All right. So if you bring health and try to convince a person to go vegan because it's good for their health, then you're not doing animals justice because it's not about your health. It's about the life of the animal that doesn't want to die. It, and if you dilute the message of veganism with health or environment, then what other movement is there for the animals? So, so at the end of the events, all these hotel events and stuff, uh, I was approached by other activists who have been effectively doing outreach in their own countries. And we tried actual activism, which is going to the streets, talking to the actual non-vegans, showing them the truth of what happens in factory farms, what happens in animal agriculture. And I never look back from that because every time you did it and at the end of every outreach conversation, okay, not every, but most of it, you ask these people, are you okay with this happening? Usually the answer is no. Can you go vegan? Yes. Maybe not immediately, okay? We'll give them some, we'll give them a card. We'll tell them, okay, you can learn more. Go home, do your research. Act based on truth. So you don't have to lie to people that it's going to be good for health because a meat-based diet can be good for health as well if you do it right. If a meat-based diet can be good for environment as well. So anyways, we've been doing it for four years now street activism and it works. We don't usually get any backlash. Once or twice, we do. But as a vegan, you know, you get backlash every day, right? Mm -hmm. So that can't be helped. What can help is the simple and honest method of just telling people the truth, that this is not okay. The animals, they are no different from us. They suffer the same way. They don't want to die. They want to live their lives peacefully. And you're denying them their basic rights. What did they do to de deserve that? They're innocent. Right? So this basic truth being shared does not get backlash. Maybe a few, but most of the time, no. But when you go around the bush, saying things like, oh, it's good for the environment as well and good for your health. Then we have done that in AV. Uh, when I first started, it used to be about health, environment, and animals. So we did try to, you know, put the, try to highlight the selfish nature of people and say that, oh, it's good for your health, it's good for environment. But as soon as you did that, you stop talking for the animals, they think you're bullshitting, they think this is cheap marketing, and they just walk off. So uh, AV keeps evolving the way we outreach. And now it's strictly and solely for the animals. And it's working. It works. So wait, you you said that um you talk to people. Do you do they, do you follow up with the people and see like if they actually turn to veganism? Mm, some that have volunteered for us as a non-vegan yeah we have such people yeah mm -hmm. they're still vegan until today but okay. we have a policy of not 
taking contacts for privacy reasons. Mm -hmm, so we yeah. don't do the follow up. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you said that um, AV anonymous for the voiceless, if uh, the participants don't know, um, you said they used to focus on health and environment as well. Do you, do you think yeah, like that's not like, it, it didn't work? Just... You're saying that it just didn't yeah, work, yes, or yes. how? It absolutely does not work. You cannot be vegan for health. You cannot be vegan mm -hmm. for environment. Because why vegan is about not harming animals. If you go mm -hmm. vegan for health, you cannot be hundred percent plant based when it comes to your diet alone. All right. Then there's more things, right? Like zoos, right? Uh, and any other ways animals are being exploited, animal testing. So what? You're okay with animal testing and going to the zoo, but you are vegan? That's not possible. <laughs> Do you mm -hmm. see that? Because the original reason for the word being coined itself is to differentiate it from vegetarianism. Those are okay with dairy and eggs. Vegans are not okay with harming animals. Mm -hmm. okay all right so i think we'll uh just move on to the other speakers first before we get back to that um faisal do you want to introduce yourself okay all right so hello everyone my name is faisal i am currently the secretary for the malaysian vegetarian society and i uh, together with my wife uh we, Aina, uh, we also run a kind of boutique uh, wellness kind of uh, coaching consultancy under Amazingly Fit, where we promote plant-based dietary habits and so forth. And um, yep, uh, I'm fairly young in the scene, uh, comparatively to Mr. Ratna and uh, Vina, who we have seen as the pioneers in this space, uh, definitely. Uh, and have been uh, our source of inspiration for many, many years. And um, so, um, but yes, I think uh, there are many different approaches that how we view things nowadays. Um, uh, I don't deny the, the original meaning and interpretation of veganism is all about the animals. And uh, that's for sure. Uh, and probably that's why we are more... Um, in a way, promoting the plant-based lifestyle kind of thing to to show and introduce people that there is um, benefits from adopting uh, certain dietary habits and so forth. Uh, and that's where our advocacy lies because uh, me and my wife, we have been in the wellness space in the past almost 20 years now. Um, we've been... Uh, uh, personally developing ourselves in terms of nutrition, dietary habits, and so forth. Of course, it wasn't plant-based from day one. So we were all about low-carb, low-fat diets in the beginning and all the other kind of diets, the keto diet, this diet, that diet. And eventually, we found a plant-based diet. And based on a lot of uh, scientific evidence through many, many good uh, resources like PCRM and um, nutrition facts from Dr. Greger, have uh, kind of like um, convinced us that, yeah, the plant-based diet is the way to go. And of course, this is how actually how kind of uh, we got into the space of vegan, the veganism world in a way. All right. So that's how we got in. And I think um, um, I would uh, say that um, I guess it depends on the individual, what they are able to resonate with. Uh, some people would resonate more with animals, some will be resonating more with uh, the environment and some would be more on the health aspect. So, I mean, for us, it was the health aspect in the beginning. And then through a lot of other, um, of course, uh, like Ratna said, I mean, once we do our research and really look and dig deeper and watch all these documentaries, thanks to Netflix and YouTube, uh, then we realize there's a lot more things that's going on, especially in the environmental space that I thought was, um, uh, I would say, uh, nonsensical in a way that it doesn't make sense that we should be uh, exploiting and over indulging just for the sake of our so-called well-being in a way or just to uh, satisfy the human taste buds. Uh, 
um, while doing very um, damaging things to the environment and which not just impacts ourselves as individuals, but also the global population and future generations. I think that's, that's the more um, devastating thing. But yeah, I guess that's why we're having this forum. And uh, yeah, uh, but yeah, I think um, as uh, I'm still growing into the fact that um, yep, animals, uh, of course, do have a place. Uh, I never grew up in a pet environment, <laughs> uh, if that is something to be talking about later. But yeah, we're focusing on the farm animals. Uh, but um, so I guess my affinity to animals was not very much ingrained from the beginning. That's how I was brought up. Uh, very different to what my wife Aina was brought up where they always had cats and pets. And uh, so that affinity to animals was always there. So very different. I guess it depends on your cultural upbringing and so forth and how you see things. But yeah, I mean, through all this learning and all this um, searching um, and researching, um, I begin to understand more and uh, trying to empathize with a lot more of these issues that we will be discussing further on. Thank you. So like to clarify, like you went into, uh, say, plant-based through the wellness and the health approach. That's your understanding initially. But then right now, you're also learning about the the animal, uh, you know, complications, the issues that's going on. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, yeah. especially, especially like uh, recently, I'm not sure if everyone has heard about the dairy cow, uh, dairy farm incident in Texas, where the headline was one human died, but 18,000 cows, dairy cows died at the same time in the same incident. So I think that was kind of, um, well, it was very devastating news for anyone to hear and um, I thought that was uh, unforgivable I'm not sure why they couldn't just let them loose or whatever so probably have other reasons that was not made known but um, it is a sad fact and reading up more on it it's not the first time that it's happened but it is one of the worst that has happened in the U.S. All right. And um, I think just a month ago, also, there have been a lot of uh, avian flu outbreak in Asia. So AAA might not have a lot more information about that. But yeah, I mean, like, uh, uh, I think there was a mass culling in Japan and other parts in that area where they have killed millions of chickens in the uh, farm, modern farming industries because of the avian flu. So just because people want to eat uh, meats and poultry and so forth, right? So, mm -hmm. which I think something needs to change. So I believe in food system change and things need to happen. And ultimately, we can still meet the objective of preserving the lives of these animals. I mean, probably in a very different way how uh, Ratna is doing it. But I think um, there is a part in it that that we see fit and that we can contribute in. Mm -hmm. and also sorry one more thing like but when you said plant-based is that does that mean like vegan diet all right or... very good question yeah uh, i guess that's a very that's a toss-up for anyone to interpret uh, but uh yeah i mean when we uh, personally when uh, myself or when the mvs talks about plant-based we do actually mean vegan uh, meaning to say that it is uh, avoiding all animal sauce uh, foods including milk uh, eggs honey and so forth i mean that's our definition i think there's many definitions out there so i guess uh, it is for us to promote what's best uh, and, and for us what i mean for me personally i i believe uh, as a marketer as well and uh, somebody who has been dealing in marketing and communications for quite some time professionally as well um, we just need to be able to reach to the audience how they speak. And so, in my opinion, um, just plant-based seems a little bit less threatening compared to the vegan phrase, unfortunately. And I guess that's how people perceive it normally. Um, but I do agree, I mean, like Ratna's approach also does warrant some um, value as well to some degree, especially to, to show and demonstrate to people that these things are happening. Yeah, I think we will be discussing more about that later. Okay, thanks, Faisal. Um, 
So Davina, yeah, can you just tell us a bit about yourself, uh, what you've been doing in the vegan scene? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Davina. Um, I've been a plant-based lifestyle advocate in Malaysia for the past six years, I think, since 2017-ish. Um, I started out initially simply as um, a Facebook page to share recipes to my friends because they kept bugging me for recipes whenever I put up a photo of my food on my personal profile. So it started out with very humble beginnings. And then at some point, I got approached by a friend of mine who had a boutique talent agency to see if I could make my passion into a career. And hence, that's when my my actual um an actual job as a plant-based lifestyle advocate, which is what I was pressured to kind of coin for myself because there was no kind of term for it at the time uh, for what I was doing, at least in Malaysia. And that was how the career was born. And so I started going out and doing um, workshops and demonstrations and presentations, uh, recipe development. I, had, I started out uh, as one of my core things that I had for me and my brand was my website, Davina De Vegan, where I shared uh, recipes that were Malaysian recipes made vegan or an international recipe that I would then try and make as accessible as possible by using fresh local produce. And also I did videos, which I realize now took a lot of resources, <laughs> bless youth. <laughs> um, videos on where to find really good plant-based food around the Klang Valley. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I started out going vegan uh, previously from being a vegetarian because I realized that as a vegetarian, I wasn't really hitting all the, I wasn't hitting all the marks of what I wanted for my life. And um, the more I read up about veganism, the more I realized that it completely aligned with everything that I wanted for my life. And the kind of things that I wanted my life to represent, which was, you know, uh, caring for the environment, prioritizing my health, and of course, always showing compassion for others. So initially it was out of compassion when I went vegetarian. And then when I went vegetarian, it was only about six months in that I realized incidentally that it was improving my health. And I thought that I was healthy already, but I didn't know that I could be healthier. And this was being a, a corporate person at the time, doing your typical nine to five, being as active as I possibly could be in my free time, having a very busy schedule, having a double life as, you know, corporate person, and then doing all this theater stuff after hours, um, realizing how much energy I had from not even eating healthily, but just cutting out meat from my diet and still having egg, not so much dairy at the time because I was lactose intolerant already. Um, so I realized in my own time and from my own experience, incidentally, that a plant-based diet could be healthier, even just default the moment you stop eating meat. And uh, I realized I was onto something. And when I got approached to do plant-based lifestyle advocacy as a career, that was when I realized, wow, I feel this is really my calling because I felt that I had something to say, but I didn't have an audience. So the moment I started doing this, this um, brand development in my advocacy, that was when I realized that Malaysia didn't really have someone like me at that point in time who was promoting the Malaysian narrative of what veganism is like. So initially I started go I started out being quite hesitant initially about creating Malaysianized veganism because I felt that wasn't like, oh, I can't do that. I don't know anything about local produce. I don't know anything about local recipes. Um so thankfully with my uh with my manager's encouragement, I went down that path and I realized that that was so helpful not just for the audience and for my brand, but for me as well, because then I realized how much I've been missing out on with all the fresh produce, spices and herbs that I would have turned a blind eye to because I refused to acknowledge the Malaysian narrative of veganism. And now that I have, I find so much joy in it. And it might not be everyone's cup of tea to learn things about how to make their own food, but it does pique 
someone's interest every now every now and then when I introduce a new ingredient that somebody in a, in the audience has never heard of they they come to me later on they're like wow didn't even know this existed wow didn't even know that we have this superfood so my angle has uh from a, about advocacy has shifted from on a personal level from compassion to health to now food because it's personally what brings me the most joy. And it's also an angle which I find as the years have gone by, being able to reach out in my presentations and my speaks and my talks to hundreds of thousands of people around Malaysia, both in KL and outside it, realizing that the thing that really connects us is our food culture, as unhealthy as it can be, what we are connected, how we are connected as Malaysians, and what's in our DNA as Malaysians is food. So uh, learning how to speak the language of Malaysians is what has really humbled me to realize that um, there is a different, for, for every kind of advocacy there is out there, what kind of angle there is, there is always going to be an audience. And I found my calling with, with um, food advocacy I've learned that, especially with Malaysians, people say, I've learned that people, like Malaysians generally are lazy. They are, um, they, they live a lifestyle that doesn't allow them the time to eat healthy, prioritize their health, prioritize the environment, prioritize themselves even. And they also have very, very strong connections with their friends and their family and their social network. So the things that bring us out is food. The things that we express love with is food and everything's about food. And it's so, I, I realize it's, you can, you can, it's easy to tell somebody to go vegan, but all the, all the attachments that we have to food our relationship with food, our relationship with our elders, our relationship with our social uh, and our community. Um, unless we find way to detach ourselves from all of that, not not even talking about our uh, our traumas that that lead to how, when, why we eat. Until we start learning how to detach ourselves from all of those attachments, telling somebody to just go vegan is is just going to be someone that's just going to be something that's just going to be taken with a pinch of salt. So, uh, yeah, food advocacy is my way to go at the moment. In my very core, absolutely, I'm a, I would say I'm a closet, <laughs> compassionate vegan, but that's not what I, that's not what I, want to be known as because Ratna is doing that job. So I find I find it very interesting that we have this panel of like me like talking about how amazing we you can make nasi ulam in jars and put it in the fridge. And then you've got like Faisal who's talking about the wellness element and Ratna who's really doing all the groundwork of outreach and showing the truth behind what goes behind closed doors. I think when you have all of our different uh, expertise coming together, that's when we are addressing as many audiences as possible because luckily each of us on this panel we're inclined towards a plant-based diet slash vegan diet uh in our own way based on our own personal journey so for every kind of advocacy there is out there every kind of angle there is there's always going to be somebody who's going to resonate with that so that's been my journey so far mm. Thanks, Davina. Yeah, like you mentioned, I think we all have this common like baseline of compassion to animals. Like I think we all have that in us. It's just how we approach other people or how we approach our advocacy is slightly it's different. And different people resonate with different kinds of like advocacy. Though like at the very origin of it, like veganism is like an animal rights kind of movement that can't really be denied. But like then there's also 
other types of advocacy that's growing that can bring people to that vegan core. I think that's like my current understanding of it. But like for Davina, like how how has people uh, reacted to your uh, advocacy approach? Like, do you see people or like have people send you a message like, oh, they turn vegan because of your food creations or what, what you advocate for? That kind of thing. Ah, so I think what resonated with um with Ratna's line of advocacy is what not people is is something that didn't really resonate with people about about 20 years ago when I first started becoming quite vocal about why I wanted to go vegetarian. I think Malaysians are generally becoming a bit more aware, thanks to social media, about being a bit more mindful about their choices. So I'm sure what what I did at that time would be a bit more effective now. But when I started out being, but also at that time, I came across as a bit self-righteous. And I do acknowledge that I wasn't really well equipped with the with how to address things that I was concerned about in a compassionate way. Um, mm-hmm. So you're asking me like how people have connected with my current advocacy, you mean, with food? Mm-hmm. Ah. Um, well, I think there have been some successes with people being more mindful about their choices generally, but going fully vegan, very, very few. I think I've only heard of one person who's gone fully vegan thanks to my work. And definitely no one has gone vegan from following my recipes on uh, on my website and it's because I also learned along the way that not everyone is passionate about making food in the kitchen like me so I could be making the most elaborate recipes thinking that oh the more elaborate it is the more people are going to pick it up because it's going to be so special <laughs> nobody's gonna and realizing that most Malaysians don't have three hours to make the perfect quiche <laughs> so um, so I think people got inspired by my recipes but most of the time people asked me if I could make it for them for a fee. I know that some people have benefited overseas um, for uh, people who wanted to try out Malaysian flavors or Malaysians living overseas. They say that I've gotten messages where they are thankful that I have recipes that they can access to help them create healthy dishes at home. Uh, I've had someone who has said, thanks to you, thanks to your workshop, I now have shifted completely to uh, only making overnight oats or smoothies for breakfast. So I find that the incremental approach and the activation is what is most effective with my advocacy. And for me, that's the biggest success that, that I have experienced so far. Previously, using the health or the environmental or the compassionate approach, Malaysians would say, oh, I love what you do, but I love meat way too much. So that was when I realized that Malaysians, they, they're not quite there as a, as a society to, uh, to see animals as sentient beings. They still commodify animals. They still see it as a thing because they say, I miss my meat too much, which means they're, 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 um, what do you call it? Their cognitive dissonance is just way strong for me to even try and address anything that has anything to do with their health and the environment and the animals. So meeting them where they are, just showing food for what it is and how tasty it can be, regardless of what it's made of, is I think it not only brings peace to um, and comfort to the people I reach out to, but it also brings comfort to me because I get a lot less frustrated about me not feeling like I'm doing enough or like I'm not spreading the right message or like, why are, why are people not connecting the dots? Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, I find that it's been, um effective with the resources that I have and the resources that my audience has mm-hmm. okay thanks Davina so 
yeah I guess like that's a different kind of like effectiveness different levels of effectiveness I guess and your the incremental approach you said that it's like the most effective to get people engaged so um knowing that like Malaysians are lazy probably selfish as well so how for right now like how does this like you know reflect on your kind of like approach yeah. and do so, do you see that people are selfish and lazy and <laughs> like and what's like I would is love it really to respond effective to that, actually. yeah please go ahead <laughs> anyways guys uh you can go to youtube uh just search for street activism and this is a response you would get all over the world it's not just malaysians who said oh i, I love my meat it's so hard to give up but there is an effective way to talk to people which is called holding them accountable for what they are doing to the animals. So when you show them the footage and you ask them, are you okay with doing this? Why can't you just, you know, not harm them and you can still live healthily and, you know, there is, why, why don't you stop? Then they would change. Not all. Some people won't change. But... 50%, 60%, they would change. So there is an effective way to talk about it. And I mean, back when I became vegan, I didn't know the most effective way to talk to people. And I would say, okay, you can't go vegan. Why don't you try plant-based, you know, start with meat-free Mondays and go from there. But when you do that, you are commodifying the animals yourself. You're not giving them the respect that the, they deserve, which is to be left alone. I mean, just put yourself in the shoes of the animals. If someone were to harm you, would you tell the person, try not to harm me on Mondays and go from there incrementally? You won't do that. So why not we give the animals the respect that you would want others to give you? If you do that, you hold them accountable till the end. They may not change. Some people may not change for a few years. Okay, I have examples of these people. But you don't let them lose. You don't tell them, oh, you can try slowly. It's okay, it's good for your health. You, you, don't, you don't let them off the hook. Eventually they will become vegan and they have so yeah, I don't think Malaysians are lazy. I think people are lazy. People are selfish. But people need to see that this same thing could happen to them. And would what would you tell the assailant to do then? You know, those harming you. So yeah, put them in the shoes of the animals. Hold them accountable and no one, there, there's no pinch of salt. There's no arguments from this. They will respect you for telling them the truth, for showing them the truth that they were never aware because all this happens, you know, behind closed walls. That's why they call it a factory farm. It's all hidden from public view. Show them the scream of the animal. Show them how they are struggling. Most of them will change. But that said, everything has its place, all right? So there's two elements here, okay? One is why to go vegan. The answer is the animals. And the second one is how to go vegan. And this is where maybe Davina comes in, you know, all the great dishes she's doing, showing all the restaurants, all the plant-based options. So the how takes a secondary importance compared to the why, because once you learn the why, You'll figure out the how for yourself. That's the internet, right? YouTube. Davina is there. Faisal is here. Diana is here. So yeah, the how is not an issue. Everyone can show you, but the why you need to explain to people. Because without the why, the how doesn't matter. What if like people say like their why is because of the environment that they go vegan? Because there are some people who they go vegan because of the environment. So are you okay with animal testing? 
No. Well, yeah. You are the one who is going for vegan. I mean, you're not. You're for the animals. <laughs> but let's say you are calling yourself a vegan for the environment. And I ask mm-hmm. you, what do you think about animal testing or mm-hmm. using leather? So, are you okay mm-hmm. with that? So, if mm-hmm. they say, yeah, yeah it's, mm-hmm. it's still okay. It's just animal testing, uh, impossible foods that are just testing on animals. But I don't care about the animals. I don't care about them not being harmed. So, yeah, I eat impossible burger. And so you're not vegan then. I mean, let's just not fool ourselves. All right. We can be honest. If you're not a vegan, you're not a vegan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's just like more like so they're that, plant-based rather than vegan in that plant-based. sense. So then you can explain what's wrong with, you know, animal testing what's wrong with leather and what's wrong with harming animals and hopefully they actually go vegan. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a good good point there to like ask people that kind of questions. Um, but so when you the, say the like... Whole thing, sorry, sorry Diana. Yeah. So the yeah, go ahead. whole thing about having conversations is yeah, going to the why, basically. We don't, we mm-hmm. don't alienate anyone. There's no mm-hmm. judgment. We take a serious stance because that's what the animals deserve. If you were in their shoes, that's what you deserve. You deserve to be, you know, fought for like it was you being harmed. It was me being harmed. And this is what 150 million animals killed every day. Each one a Diana, a Davina, a Faisal. You know, different shapes, but what? Two eyes, one nose, one mouth, bleed rate. Don't want to die. If you show them a knife, go go towards them in a threatening way, they run away. So what's the reason for harming all these animals? There's no reason at all. Mm-hmm. So Other than, when you know, we've been doing this for a long, long time. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. When, when you said like... Uh you're holding people accountable um, during, you know, showing the footage on the street, street activism, right? How do you maintain, like, how do you make them remain accountable? Like after, you know, interacting with you, how sure are you that they will remain accountable or like that, that mm. they will go towards the path of like veganism? Like, do they f- feel more empathy for the animals? Do you think? So, so there have been quite a lot who cry. Mm-hmm. There's been people who, you know, they wanted to go to Magdi, which is in Bukit Bintang as well. And then instead they asked us, where's the nearest plant-based restaurant? <laughs> so <laughs> we get all these kinds of people. And yeah, I mean, like, okay, let's say my fiance, she approached AV when she was a vegetarian. All right. Uh, and she, same thing. Oh, it's difficult to go vegan. Where am I going? <laughs> and yeah, I just stayed firm that no, it's easy to be vegan. You just have to figure it out. And she's vegan now. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, by showing the videos, like you, you do think that people do have that feeling towards animals, like more compassion. The than... videos, the videos is really important because if you're just speaking. Right, they could be thinking of bullshitting. Sorry mm. for, for the word. But anyways, if you show what's happening and then there's no reason this this you don't have to explain too much. If they don't believe you, ask them to go to a you know factory farm themselves. Mm-hmm. And some would say, Oh, it doesn't happen in Malaysia, but then we have clips and footages from Malaysia as well. Yeah. I've seen the condition of factory farms myself. Okay. Talk to, you know, the ministries and ask them, how's the condition in there? I've shown the footage to police because I get called all the time as well. Uh, they told me that this is Panganiayan Haiwan. Yeah, so, mm. yeah. I mean, I think maybe like 
that's why I say it. it's it's about the method. If you just speak, you don't know what to speak. Yeah, it's going to go wrong. But once you learn as hard as you can, like you would for a study in you know your university, you learn the proper techniques. It works. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, Davina. Yeah, thanks. I think Rana brought up a very important thing: uh, localizing the content and making it our problem as well. I think the problem with the issue with Malaysians is that we glorify and tend to emulate very quickly everything that the West does, you know, like culture, music, food, which is why we're in this situation in the first place where we're such a meat heavy culture when we previously weren't about 50 years ago. So I think what Rana is doing with showing people what happens here because a lot of Malaysians think, oh, it's not our problem. You know, uh, people talk about like um, all this um, things about the environment with uh, meat, heavy stuff. Oh, like, oh, that's not how we don't kill so many cows here. Or like, you know, that we don't do that. We don't treat animals like that here. I think it's very important to show like, hey, you know, no one is exempt from mass animal agriculture. And I think what Faisal do does with his presentations, like localizing the content as well on an environmental aspect is very important. So I think we need to, we need to set standards of, to refer to of what happens in Malaysia and to get Malaysians to know about that because uh, it's very easy for Malaysians to say, not in our backyard. So that's what I just wanted to chime in with that. So great mm -hmm. work, Ratna. Can I add something to that? Yeah, sure. So about the local stuff, even if it's a small scale farm, all right, let's say a dairy farm, you know, those who are selling fresh milk to Indian restaurants, all right, I'm not sure whether you're aware that there's fresh milk in Indian restaurants. So I've asked these guys, the farmers, what happens to all your babies, male babies especially, because you don't have any use for the male babies. All sold to the meat industry. Mm. So, I mean, you it's easy to do your research. You know, it, you can't say that, oh, it's not happening in Malaysia because we, we are quite business-minded, okay? So we do believe in industrialization. So, you know, you can reduce costs, maximize profits. So what happens in the West is happening in Malaysia, even if it's halal. Mm -hmm. yes, Faisal. Faisal, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with everything that was said earlier. And I would just like to add, I mean, like, although we're in Malaysia, but since nowadays, it's such a global world and we get everything from everywhere. And it's not like we're 100% self-sufficient for every single thing. So definitely, whatever we consume, for, especially for those of you who are tuning in to understand more of this, right? <laughs> and understanding where we're we are trying to fit in, but when we consume things, it's not just that the Malaysian farms are producing it, but the global farms are producing it, and it's still contributing to the problem. And how economics would say it's a supply and demand thing. As long as there's demand, and if there's not sufficient supply locally, then somebody else needs to do it, and they will need to resort to all these things. And especially nowadays with the more financial burden that people are facing, People will try to get for the cheaper stuff, right? And where, how could you get cheaper meat and cheaper uh, produce, right? Then it would be probably all these intensive factory farms, which is exactly what you see on these films and movies and stuff. And I think that's where people just need to get over their heads and to understand and realize it's not just about the Malaysian farms. Malaysian farms is one thing, but even so, you'll be consuming from all over the world. And it's just like what Devina is saying. I think the 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 more um the actual fact is like what what was the phrase called Devina? Cognitive dissonance. <laughs> so, yeah, I couldn't get yeah, that. Yeah, cognitive word, right? dissonance, yeah. Yeah. So that where we don't truly understand where our food is coming from. But once we do then probably we can, because I truly believe that all human beings do have some form of compassion towards any 
living being, right? Including animals, especially, right? So, and I think that's where, I guess when Ratna uh, or Davina was saying that, uh, or Ratna was asking about the animal testing, right? Although I may have gone plant-based primarily for health and environment first, but I still care for the animals. I, it's not like I don't care at all. I mean, like, I won't go out and purposely kill them at, uh, the next day or something, right? I, I think I'm fortunate, although I was science stream, I never had to dissect an animal, <laughs> fortunately. God forbid, if I had to do that, I would probably traumatize and had nightmares. <laughs> but yeah, I didn't have to do that. So um, yeah, I had yeah, to dissect think... a frog. It stuck with me for life. Yeah, me I mean, like the I think frog that's one refused of... to die. That was oh, my terrible. goodness. <laughs> and I and to join. Oh really? I didn't want. To and, I, I, I think that's was probably the reason why I didn't want to go into medical profession either, right? I mean, of course, medical profession is always so sexy and all that, but I knew it would involve cutting people and learning the process you need to cut animals probably because I just didn't really like to see blood coming oozing out of things, right? So I don't know. I think unconsciously as a human being, I think we do have that soft spot and that compassion and um, empathy. Uh, however, I guess it depends on how best we bring that forth, right? I mean, uh, it wasn't apparent to me when I started in this journey as well. Uh, but as I grew into it, I learned more about it. And that I guess the empathy grows on you. And hopefully that's what happens to other people as, as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's important what you mentioned about the medical thing. Like, uh, back then, like I think tradition is a different thing because back then that's how people trying to understand anatomy by cutting things up, cut, cutting people and animals. So, and nowadays you have the option not to because the the knowledge is already there. So I think that kind of like similarity can apply to like veganism, like you know how the arguments of oh that was like tradition, like the current circumstances is different, whereby like animals are being farmed intensively. And that's no longer necessary in this world. So, yeah. And then I think what I'm getting is that education is also important, like w localizing the context. and But as well as like understanding that Malaysia is also part of the global econom economic system and like our uh, food is also imported. So I think that's like what people might not be aware of and that it's important to educate on that as well but at the same time like um having local um animal you know footages the factory farm footages is also great to like just like feeling like oh it's so close to home kind of thing so i would like later talk to rana like where did you get the footages i want <laughs> i want to know that too like it seems not to be available like how did you like, is it available publicly? Uh, yeah, you can find some in YouTube. Oh, is it? Okay. No, I haven't done my... Okay. So cool. Anyways, I mean, so we are talking about farm animals, like factory farms, but there's also, mm -hmm. you know, veganism is not just about not harming the farm animals. Mm -hmm. It's not harming animals at all. So even if you look after a cow in your house, treat it like your son, and at the end of it, you slaughter the cow, the cow still didn't want to die. And you're betraying your son, basically. I mean, if you looked at the cow as your son, as a family, yeah, it still doesn't make a difference. You're still harming someone who didn't want to be harmed. Mm -hmm. So the scope of veganism is further than just factory farms. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's like definitely a lot of issues with even um companion animals like dogs and cats. Like there's lots of like issues with that as well. I think there's just lots of avenue into sort of like animal welfare slash animal justice. So, but then we're focusing on farmed animals, mostly because like it's kind of a it's a big issue. It's like our daily choices as well. Like not everyone has companion animals, so. I think, yeah, we're focusing mostly on this, like this context of farmed animals because that's like the most pres pressing things that's been like, should be addressed more often than other kinds of like animal welfare issues. 
So yeah, I think. Do you think then that? Okay, I think Faisal. Like, do you think it's helpful to also have like local footages, or do you think you're current like educating? Are you? Are you assuming that you're educating people on the data in terms of like the important meat and stuff like that? Do you think? Yeah, it's also I mean, like. To have um... local... Data. I would say uh, on a personal level, I would love to see it because just to prove to myself that it is actually happening. Yes, I do. I do believe it's happening. But I guess unless you see it, then, oh, it's evidence. <laughs> you see it actually happening, right? So, um, but yeah, so I believe that it is necessary to a point. But I guess like how Ratna is saying, unless you know how to approach it and use it, uh, effectively, it, it won't work either, right? So um, there, there is a time and place to do it and how to do it. And um, I guess, I mean, it's not something that we can just put it on like um, how New York have Times Square billboard, right? In Malaysia, got apa? The, we have the lots of billboards at, at the Bukit Bintang. You cannot just like uh, present that on the, on the big billboard and get away with it without yeah. getting... <laughs> without yeah, getting yeah, oh really <laughs> okay but i mean i'm sure there's repercussions because of it right so so oh, in that in Malaysia. Mm. but the so, one I mean... that the is it sorry the the one that peter does right right now yeah yeah but that's not like um that's not very confrontational it seems i think like what faisal imagine there was some more... confrontational as well Okay. Confrontational ones. Mm. There were a few. Okay. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to say is that um, yeah, yeah, I mean those footages are good, especially for those who are ready to actually see it, right? I mean, like not everybody would be also be in a state of mind to actually see those kind of things. So I guess if you force, I don't believe it's. I mean, personally, I don't believe it's uh, good to just force showing it of course you got to approach it properly and all that and to to set the set the context properly to to actually uh, introduce those kind of footages but i believe it would be really good especially to um to show that it is actually happening in our backyard and because i mean when i discovered all these um local statistics even like what davina was saying i was surprised i mean like in fact I didn't even know that we were self-sufficient in eggs <laughs> in Malaysia. And and you know how many eggs that we Malaysians consume in a month? We eat 1 billion of those eggs in a month. And that means 12 billion eggs in a year. And according to the de uh, veterinary department, we have about 11 million uh, layer hens to, to produce all those end, eggs. So it's quite enormous numbers. And... I'm just looking at the statistics now, but based on the numbers uh, on 2020, we have about 220 million chickens in Malaysia, I believe. Yes, in Malaysia, <laughs> 220 million. That's like seven times the Malaysian population living in Malaysia, or I mean, living until they are doomed to the end. To, to serve the meat uh, industry in Malaysia. So unfortunately, as it sounds, I mean, like maybe these statistics even or people don't realize that there is so many of them and it's not just um, impacting. I mean, of course, animal welfare is definitely one thing and most important, but of course, it will definitely cause an impact to the environment, cause an impact to the local communities around there. Um, and without them knowing it, probably the things that's been polluting our waters. Don't quote me on this, but I'm still doing the research on that. Whether it does actually cause those kind of damages to our waters, to our soils, and, and to the environment at large. And um, at this trend, at, at this rate, it's not sustainable. Definitely not sustainable for Malaysia, nor the global uh, planet population. So definitely we need to address this. People definitely need to reduce their meat consumption, if possible, eliminate it altogether. And that's how, I mean, at least how I approach things and how we uh, advocate it in, in that sense. Yeah. Thanks, Faisal. Uh, Davina, did you have your hand up? 
yeah um Faisal I have so so based so what I didn't mention earlier is that um I have I have been for the past mm, almost one and a half years been associated with SBCA Salango which is a society for the prevention of cruelty to animals um which is SBCA Ampa in Salango and I have been based on my my work as a plant-based campaign manager which is uh, approaching anybody and everybody who would be willing to take on campaigns uh, to promote compassionate eating. A lot of, a lot of corporates, but my most, my, my biggest successes in my work in, with SBCA Salango comes from the corporate sector who want me to um, address plant-based eating from a sustainable aspect for them to put in it to, for them to put in their ESG report. So my work requires me to be as well as well read as possible based on whatever angle somebody wants me to address the plant-based lifestyle and whether it be health, the environment or compassion. And most of the time for the corporate sector, it's about sustainability. So I have done, uh, I have done research on the implications of factory farms on a, at least on a water contamination level. And I have, I can show you what, what I have found. There have been two, I, 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 uh, narrowed down two case studies uh, where I found um, abattoirs, uh, like studies on abattoirs in Trungano and Choho, and then in consequent, uh, and in concert, wait, con what's the word? And then the years following, studies about uh, hypoxia happening in those regions, or at least in the estuaries that uh, are in the same area as those abattoirs. So yeah, it is happening here as well. Did that did did I catch on to your did I catch on yeah. to what you were trying? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. All I right. think I think yeah, it relates. I mean, I think this is where uh, people don't realize probably they take it for granted. They think it's just like KFC just magically comes out of nowhere and just comes onto your plate. And but Malaysia being the second largest consumer of poultry. <laughs> in the world per capita is unimaginable, unfathomable. <laughs> I mean, like it's mind boggling. Uh, and uh, to think that, I mean, like the other day, I mean, Aina was saying that um, there was this case where a lorry carrying the poultry chickens, right? Those big lorries, it kind of like, um, what do you call it, toppled. And then the thing on social media was, not like everybody was going for the chickens to take them home and eat, right? But they were saying, oh, Ksenia, and sympathizing with these chickens because they were like all laid up and all over the street and all that. So it does show that Malaysians are compassionate about these animals. It's just that they don't realize it's the things that they will see at the end of the day on the on their plates. And unfortunately, that's that's what we need to educate more about and to to raise that awareness and I guess to show that there's a lot more happening beyond just the thing that you see on your plate at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I think like based on what you all have been saying that and, and your interaction with people, like people do have compassion. Like they can empathize with animals. It's just that they need to see it in front of their eyes they need to be aware of the data the information and like yeah i think it's it's horrible that how factory farms have impacted not just the animals but also the environment as well so i think that's where the like you know the initial argument of like you know vegan for the environment but it's actually also the animals aspect of it the main one the main victims are the animals so yeah that's really horrific um, but yeah, we've been doing like mostly street approach or like um, bottom up approach of activism, like the street activism, um, talking to people, doing campaigns and stuff like that. But like, how about the top down approach, like, like doing going through lawsuits and policy change? Like, do you think that would make a greater impact or like, how do you envision that to be like, um, have Right now, like, have you engaged with, say, the government on on this? Usually, there's not much responses. Uh, okay. Uh, but I mean, 
let me say it this way. So why do these industries exist? It's because people want to eat meat. You, you pay for it and you know all the slaughter happens because of you, because of the money. So if people change, then these industries will, you know, go into bankruptcy or you know become plant-based industries as as is happening, you know. Some dairy farms are now milking oats or almonds instead. So uh so first is people need to change. If people change, policies will follow suit, industries will follow suit, government will follow suit. But if the majority of people are non-vegans who want to eat animals, then government has to listen to people. I mean, we voted them into power, right? So if majority want them to do this, that's what they're going to do. So that is why, I mean, with AV, at least we are going bottom up approach which is talking to those who are actually voting, you know, for these cruel practices to exist. Mm -hmm. uh, Davina, do you have any thoughts on that? Like how effective if we'd go on a top-down approach or do you agree with Rana? So I have this change trying to ruminate in my own thoughts. What was Rana? Can you can you summarize what you were saying? I was like, how how do I feel about this? <laughs> ha, summarize. Should I just repeat myself? The, so, the, sorry, I I can summarize. Like I think uh, Rana okay. said, like, basically bottom, bottom up approach. So like if uh people firstly people need to change, and then when people change, then the policies, the industry will change, and then the government then oh. will listen to the people. Okay, yeah. I find that it would be the opposite. <laughs> I find that uh like just just basically we don't have so many case studies, but I would use the that not plastic campaign and the um the banning of plastic bags being given away for free at supermarkets being a good example. I think if uh there was nothing implemented on that on a on a legislative level, we'd still be grabbing as many plastic bags as possible. As, and I still see that, especially in the the uh, the supermarkets where you can get bags for free still. And I think, no, it's not even, that, no, sorry. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm referring to a supermarket that charges for the bags, but they take as many of those those clear grocery bags that you use to weigh stuff in. Oh. Uh... Yeah, so I find that nowadays, maybe at least in the Klang Valley, the awareness of not, of bringing your own bag to the supermarket is there only because people, because money talks and 20 cents counts. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I was speaking to one of the, the general manager or no, not the general, she was the head of communications or marketing in Tesco, uh, just as they started implementing the, the charging of plastic bags at all of their outlets. She spoke of one incident where in Malacca, just when they had started uh, implementing that charge, one of the cashiers was presented with a knife by one of these um, customers that insisted that he needed that bag. So <laughs> desperate measures, I guess, <laughs> call for desperate actions like that. But now you won't see anything like that because it's now become the norm and it's now accepted. That, and now you know that if you go to Tesco, we got to find our own bag. And that wouldn't have happened if the if the government didn't, you know, if there was no government initiative to do that. And I find that Malaysians, we're a bit, we tend to be more followers than doers. Um, so I do find that... Uh, especially with how effective we were with um, following SOPs during lockdown and MCO, I think we're very, very good at following orders. And we are not the type to rebel. We are not the type who's, who's going to like try and take over the government, gather in numbers. We're just going to complain a bit in a, in a little, you know, circles of gossip. And then we're just going to let things be. He was like, ah, it's just the way it is now, isn't it? So I find that as if if the government, if somebody in power is a vegan, I mean, God bless the day when that will happen. But if there's somebody who has the power and the lifestyle to to 
to feel inclined to implement these kinds of things, then I find that is what I feel would be the most effective way to, to become a more vegan informed and vegan aware and vegan implemented nation. Yeah, thanks, Davina. Uh, Faisal, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I love uh, Davina's example of the plastic campaign. I think, yeah, I agree that was an effective top-down, I guess, approach of on things. And I, I believe a top-down approach is uh, relevant and still important in any context. And uh, this also needs that as well. It's just that it's not going to be easy either. So, of course, um, the bottom ups approach is very important as well. Uh, like uh, right now, we're saying uh, to, to create that the demand for it, right? And when and politicians are easy to sway, once people want it, they go for it, right? But of course, at the same time, uh, it doesn't stop us from also approaching these uh, policymakers and all that. And that's a lot of the work that I'm doing now with uh, the Malaysian Vegetarian Society. And uh, also coming soon, I'll also be involved with the ProVeg International, where we will be doing a lot more of these activities in terms of stakeholders, uh, engagements, and all that, and to try to make them realize that things need to change. And I think this is where um, the animal, um, I say, the animal approach to it may not be the first choice for them. <laughs> right i mean like unless like they're like vegetarian or vegan already and they would understand and empathize and directly um relate with us right but if not then i guess this is where we uh, at least from our perspective um the health environment approach is uh, more suited for this especially now that sustainability is the buzzword for any corporate any governments out there especially when it comes to climate change, addressing climate change. So that is the angle that we are approaching it and how uh, food systems is very important for food security and that when we reduce our dependency on meat and meat consumption at large, that's how we can actually have a more sustainable environment, sustainable climate and sustainable um, uh, producing and um, providing for all the people and all mankind. Uh, and I think hopefully this will be a better way to approach things and how stakeholders and policymakers would try to address these uh, things. And hopefully then we can have something like the 20 cents um, tax on meat maybe right now. Because in Malaysia, we have subsidies for everything, non-plant. <laughs> we, have, we have, oh, except sugar and oil. Okay, so we have subsidies on eggs. I think they were lifting it at one point, right? They will be floating egg prices in the future. Uh, um, yeah, I think dairy is also subsidized in some degree. Meat and poultry definitely is controlled price, right? And whenever you see controlled pricing, that means there's subsidies. That means our taxpayer money is actually contributing and fueling these, uh, these industries and these parties. So I think when we remove that altogether, and if they want to subsidize, let it be fruit and veggies, <laughs> for God's sake hopefully, right? Or, or rice. I don't mind subsidizing rice, but don't try not to subsidize everything else that can actually not only harm the environment, but also harm of individuals as more and more of this evidence is um, coming up and uh, scientifically back, right? And uh, the good thing now with the Malaysian Vegetarian Society, I will, I'm pleased to announce, uh, although it's not out yet, <laughs> but uh, we are actually working very closely with the Ministry of Health Malaysia. And hopefully by this year, fingers crossed, we'll have the uh, dietary guidelines for vegetarians. So it's a step. It's not ideal. I mean, it's not the dietary guideline for everyone to adopt, but at least it's something towards that aim. Uh, it's kind of like uh, legalizing and recognizing that a vegetarian diet is healthy for individuals and how individuals can have a healthy vegetarian diet. I think that's the aim of this uh, dietary guidelines. And hopefully then later on, the next phase, they'll incorporate a lot of these things that we promote in the vegetarian dietary guidelines into the normal dietary guidelines. And where this is where um, systematically, we can see that people will take a more serious stance in it and people will be educated about it from, from the kindergartens to all the way to the university levels. And hopefully this will make a more um, impactful change in the future. But of course, these things, 
policy changes does take time. Uh, lobbying does take time. Um, unfortunately, we don't have money for lawsuits. So I don't think we're in that game as of yet. I mean, uh, not yet. Or not me personally, but maybe somebody else who is bold enough to do it. By all means, if there's a case, and then go for it, right? So, but yeah, I mean, like um, uh, Malaysian Vegetarian Society and the Pro Veg International will be doing a lot more of these kind of work. And um, if anyone here has that kind of uh, influence with the stakeholders or have any relation with those stakeholders and can connect us to those kind of uh, decision makers, then please um, let's collaborate and let's work on it together. And we can do something significant together, but we do need a collective to work on it, right? It's not just going to be MVS or ProVeg or stuff, but it will be a collective and we can be collaborating together with each, uh, all these great NGOs and other working organizations, yeah. Thanks, Thank Faisal. You. Oh, yes, Davina. So sorry, I don't mean to digress, but uh, like some something that what Faisal had mentioned earlier uh, really struck me. Um, and I... Oh, I think it was like about the just doing things on um, like having talks with the you know Ministry of Health and all that. I I find that veganism is quite an intersectional topic, so I was I just saw um an amazing documentary yesterday about the it's called the need to grow, and um it just reminded me of, uh, and listening to what Faisal had mentioned just now, I realized that I think we all aside from having this this wonderful like vegetarian guide to be hopefully um this food pyramid for vegetarians i think we also need to find ways on how to how do we improve our yield of vegetables here to make ourselves oh i think you you mentioned food insecurity so yeah so malaysia is like the eighth most insecure nation with food in the asia pacific and I think only about 2.5% of our land is arable. And I've been told that, I think it was just, maybe somebody had just mentioned to me, I don't have the science behind it or like the stats, but I'm not too surprised that it's true that most of our fresh produce that we get in the Klang Valley is all from Cameron Highlands. And I'm sure that's all just dead soil. <laughs> so I think we also need to find ways to um, also at some point along the way to also collaborate with the Ministry of Agriculture to use more sustainable ways of farming and not just rely on agri-tech, which is what their priority is right now, just improving agri-tech, agri-tech. But there's only so much you can till the soil and like pump fertilizers and all that and introduce GMOs and all that until we really just cannot use the soil at all. So I think we need to also meet then the the growing demand for vegetables with the supply of vegetables which we should be growing in a more sustainable manner thanks for adding that davina that's so important i think yeah um this whole food insecurity issue it's a definitely a side topic which is is great that you brought up but it's it's, it's important to keep the how of veganism as ratna mentioned so yeah once i guess we get the why on board then the how is than the the following approach that we have to tackle so yeah okay we're almost towards the end and um i can see lots of like comments thank you so much everyone for engaging um, and also a couple of questions but first i would like to uh put up a poll it's the same question as the the first one so now with all the knowledge from all the speakers that you've listened to so which do you think, which advocacy approach do you think is most effective to encourage Malaysians to go vegan? Give a one minute or so. Is the poll there? Okay. Okay, got people answering. Wow, somebody answered everything. <laughs> <laughs> like, we need to tackle this on all fronts <laughs> like the Sinzu art of war right Davina yes. tackle it yes. from all angles the flanks <laughs> oh wait Sita's asking how do I access the poll Sita do you can you see the poll now I hope you can okay I see people answering. Wait, you can see me only. Wait, are you using iPhone? 
I'm not sure how that works on iPhone. But you can just like, okay, try pressing the poll button. Can you see the poll button? Okay. In any case, like you can just like add your comments here as well. Okay. I think I'm going to give just a few seconds to see if Sita's managing the poll. Okay, so the leading is still is dietary like a hundred percent. Cool. Okay. I think I should end the poll now. Okay, three, two, one. Let's share results. Okay, so um, is there a way to compare both polls? Mm, oh, that's a good idea. Wait, let me just see. Wait, if I go back, what happened? Oh wait, I sh I can't share the previous one uh, anymore. You, you so the, the, so, but uh, I can see. Yeah, is there a thing? Is that yeah, is there I, such I, a thing? I, I can do it. Ooh, okay. Technology. Uh, you have to end the poll first. I'll have you end the poll. Oh, okay. Okay. Wait, I've ended the poll, but I'm still sharing it. Mm -hmm. okay. But. Well, anyway, um, the first one was uh, dietary and uh, environmental stunts that was um, tied, followed by political and animal liberation. And then the final one, the uh, animal liberation increases. So, and dietary is the first and then environmental, and then animal liberation, and political stance. So people don't seem to see that. Oh, policy is working. Okay, that's great. Um, but yeah, I guess mainly I think all the approaches might be useful. Okay, I think I stopped sharing. Okay. Um, so I think we have a couple of questions from Raymond. So... Uh, I think the first one was, will, will having a slew of local clips be a game changer? I think we kind of like answered that. Um, it could be potentially. What do you guys think? Do you have anything to add on that? Well, right now, is, I mean, is there a substantial amount? <laughs> no. Yeah. No. no. Because industry standard is the same everywhere. They want to make mm. the most money. They want to reduce costs as much as possible. So the Malaysian businesses are following industry standard, international industry standards. So mm. the fact of the matter is for people to realize that it's harm to it's wrong to harm animals. It doesn't the extent matters less, whether it's you know they're suffering more or suffering less, kill faster or slower. The fact of the matter is the animals don't want to suffer, they don't want to die. So, like, I, that, that is why I give you the example of even if you look after the animals in your house, you know, as best as you, as you can, you're still violating the animals by killing the animal. Davina mm. Faisal, you want to add on or? You mean to Raymond's question? Yeah. The, the, yeah about the clips. Yes. yes, absolutely. I would share that in a heartbeat, whether people mm -hmm. like it or not, because we just don't have enough Malaysian content. Mm -hmm. It's not enough. Not enough for Malaysians to make the connection that we need to be accountable as well. And we would love to see it in from the different species too. So dairy, uh, the cattle, the chickens, the swine mm -hmm. maybe, and even aquatic as well. Overfishing um, is a oh, huge yeah. problem, but hardly anybody acknowledges it. So not sure. Yes. Of course, there's a lot of factors there. But yeah, I mean, yeah. but people and do face told, the harsh reality of uh, increasing prices. They do face that, but they don't mm -hmm. see why, is, why, what is it caused by, right? So. What's the real cost of it? Uh, mm. And also I've been told that the, um, the, the swine uh industry here it has close to no regulations because it's not a priority here because of uh because 
of um because we're not a um I mean just because we're an Islamic country and I can't imagine like how what what people get away with in those places I think that would be like the absolute I think if there was any documentary similar to Dominion but from a Malaysian perspective I think that would be like the absolute that would be the part where everyone just it would be the part reserve right the end right before people say but you can go vegan <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can imagine the swine industry being absolutely horrific here because mm -hmm. at least yeah. because at least with the the beef here there's the halal aspect that you need to comply to mm -hmm. but there's i don't think there's any compassion applied any kind of any kind of zoodle there's, compassion there's supposed to be this uh what do you call it? certified humane what's it called right now do you know the certified humane farming practices or something is that in malaysia yeah yeah i heard that there's a few farms in malaysia who got it already so but unfortunately we don't know how much humane is it <laughs> like right now saying right so do what it is and i guess uh, they just adhere to certain other standards and stuff. Yeah, there's that farm. Um, was it um LT LTK the egg farmer? What's his name? I think it's LTK. I might be getting it wrong. LT starts with L. Yeah, with the it, egg, uh, the egg. Egg. Yeah, yeah. yeah the egg do, do you know about this? L something something, but I might confuse it with another company that starts with L, and they are mass egg producer. And I don't want to get my facts mixed up. But there's one, yeah, there's one farmer, he he saw the demand for uh, humane eggs and he, most of his business is commercialized egg farming, but he has a small part which he does out of compassion and he does because he knows it's the right thing to do, but it's just not financially sustainable for him. And that's where he has the, the humane certified eggs. Mm. And he only, unfortunately, has... Um, had such a small market for it and he I remember when I met him and he spoke to a small group of us in another NGO who met up and he's like please please get everyone to buy our eggs because it's not cheap <laughs> it's not I mean yeah so the eggs are double the price of everyone of all the other eggs and the the space that they have to allocate to all these chickens and make sure that the chickens are well looked after so it's so intensive with manual labor and resources you know money time it's just not a sustainable business so we also need to yes like on a ground level i do agree with uh, ratna yeah we do need people to start making more choices from a part from a personal value aspect rather than an economic aspect but this i mean that's a whole nother kind of worm isn't it? like how do we address that <laughs> When some people don't even have the means to get food on their plate, you know, it's like ah, mm. that's <laughs> yeah. another that's another discussion for sure. Um, okay, another question I think for Raymond as well. Um, will celebrities coming on board the vegan shit make a difference? Like the role model? I think so. <laughs> I think so, especially yeah. if they're influential enough and they do have presence in the vast communities and in a very mixed Malaysia as we are, we need from all across uh, the cultures, right? So mm. but I guess the challenge is to find those uh, people who yeah. we can uh, leverage with and collaborate with and uh, sing the same tune, right? So I guess that's a work in progress for me, at least. Yeah. Not sure yes. about Davina. Davina is a celebrity have... already. <laughs> Micro. <laughs> <laughs> I think we do have celebrities on board who resonate with the message, but they are not vegan yet or they're mostly plant-based, but not vegan. So if that's something we're willing to work with and collaborate with, then yes, I think that that would be a definitely a good angle to 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 reach out to more people. Right now, what do you think? Individual action. Individuals need to change. So you, you, can, you can change people just because you are really nice with them or you are their favorite celebrity, people are not going to change. People change when they realize the truth. That's what changes people. Because, I mean, we don't have that much like plant-based celebrities in Malaysia, but what happens in like Europe or US is there'll be 
they call themselves vegan for one or two years. And then all of a sudden they'll switch back to eating eggs and fish because, you know, doctor says you're lacking those things. So as far as celebrities go, it's not really working worldwide. Mm. Because, okay. I mean, I wouldn't say it right now, but past few years, veganism or rather vegan diet was a trend. So a lot of celebrities were going vegan. Yeah. And yeah, they switch back. Yeah. That's another it's just issue. you watch Game Changers, you watch Game Changers and Arnold Schwarzenegger is like all, oh, plant-based, eat Beyond Burger. And then a few months later, you see him, you know, eating fish and meat. <laughs> so yeah. message is there to that. Hmm. I think it's like the hype at the moment may be yeah. good, but then in the long term might not be sustainable. Yeah. Um, I guess we have uh, time for one more question. I think Sita's asking how about a collaboration of NGOs since there can be different approaches to advocacy. Like, for example, there are environmental awareness NGOs whose values align with vegetarianism slash veganism. Yeah, so what for uh, the Malaysian Vegetarian Society, we've, we've been working with uh, a few NGOs uh, together on certain things, uh, especially the environmental ones, because... Um, of course, uh, they see the environmental impact. And I think there's two parts to it. One is those who don't realize it and one who does realize it. So the ones who realize it, it's easy to collaborate with, of course. And they understand and we can straight away do things together. And we've done a few webinars together and um, workshops together. However, those who don't actually realize it yet, it's a bit more of educating them and getting them on board into the same mission and kind of like um, making them understand that it is uh, something that they should also um, put into their agenda when they talk to people, because they're going to be talking to people anyway, right, on, on the environmental aspect. So we want them to also talk and at least touch on the fact that when people reduce the demand for meat and dependency on the meat consumption, uh, it will help with the environment. And hopefully we can get more of those to be involved as well as we move forward yeah but yeah i'm glad to say that we have been engaging with some uh maybe uh if you haven't heard i forgot the name of the organization the tree hugger is that a tree hugger one <laughs> uh the free tree society yes free tree society yeah azreen <laughs> and yeah so they uh they happen to be vegans as well so that's great so it's easy to work with them and they can so in case you need to do something on environment you can always uh, reach out to them and then uh, we um, uh, we have also been working closely with grass malaysia which is a more malay-based environmental group um, they acknowledge that um, going meatless does help with the environment and does play a role and uh, we do want to continue um, fostering that uh, kind of uh, resource and knowledge and because they have an audience, a whole different audience that we don't have access to. So definitely we want to be able to collaborate with them and do more work with them. And that's the way that we will be moving forward in the few, next few years, yeah. I'd like to quickly clarify that the egg farmer is LK Fresh, not LK. Oh, okay. LK is a commercial farm. It's like the commercial eggs, only commercial eggs. LK Fresh is the one that has a humane certified egg variation. That's all. Thanks, Davina. Okay. Um, okay, whoa, we just got another new question coming up. Okay. Um, to whom can students in institutions of higher learning approach who are not given? Well, wait, what's this? I don't understand this question. <laughs> Vegan options in schools, perhaps? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, all right, okay. Ravi, are you a student? At at the moment, if you can answer, you can um, unmute if you, if it's easier. Okay, uh, maybe from the Malaysian uh, vegetarian. I'm not. I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not a student, uh, but students have complained to me. Oh, okay, great. So, so what, um, they, they, they are not given uh, vegan or vegetarian option. 
see the yes. cafeteria doesn't sell that and then we are facing a lot of problem uh, very true no food, no. so how can we help them or i'm a member of mvs how we can help mm. them Okay, great, Ravi. I think that's great to hear that you have been getting feedback direct from them as well. Hopefully, maybe you can direct them to me as well, the feedback. And because uh, we we understand from the Malaysian Vegetarian Society, we have been um, engaging with a few public universities in Malaysia and a few other private ones. And we notice the trend is all public universities do not have vegetarian options at the moment on campus. Uh, so the closest is they need to grab the food from outside. But of course, that will be a lot costlier, especially for the students at the moment, right? So um, we are working towards and trying to establish uh, a policy per se, but of course, that will take some time. At the moment, if we have some more feedback directly from the students, if you can forward them to the Malaysian Vegetarian Society, I will put my our email later on, and then uh, maybe you can help to forward these comments or directly WhatsApp them to me, and then we can use them as evidence to these universities as well as we engage with the administrators and so forth. So we do, uh, we are engaging with university level, and in the future, I will we will try to engage as well with the Ministry of Education and see if we can make this a policy because uh, last year, um, if um, many may not be aware, but the Malaysian Vegetarian Society also managed to pass a policy through the Ministry of Health to ensure that all public hospitals must have a vegetarian option cafe or um, vegetarian options in their cafeteria. Uh, that's, that's the word. All right. So if you go to any public hospital cafeteria at the moment, by right, they should have vegetarian options on their menu. If they don't, if you go to a public hospital the next time and you don't see that, please do um, raise that up again to the Malaysian Vegetarian Society as we, of course, we understand that enforcement is the next part of it once policies are uh, introduced. And so that will be the next thing that we need to look into. But yes, um, the institutions are the next thing that we want to tackle. Yep. Thank you. Uh, yeah, right now. What if what if I go to the hospital and it's a vegetarian option, but it's not vegan? Ah, uh, yes, that's the next phase right now. <laughs> we we need to address as well, and we need stop, to. Stop. So, uh, yeah, exactly. So MVS has also been uh, trying to establish this kind of like um, guideline for food operators, kind of thing, to kind of like clearly show what is the difference and what we mean by vegetarian, what we mean by vegan food, and all that and to ensure that it's omitting all dairy, milk, cheese, eggs, um, and all the derivatives that people sometimes may take for granted, right? And may miss out on the little, little things, but those things do count as well, like what Rana has pointed out. Like the simple thing like mayo, right? What people sometimes often uh, forget that, conveniently forget that there's eggs inside of mayo, right? So, uh, and stuff like that. So yeah, but definitely something that we would like to address. Um, but haven't really rolled out I yet. I would but suggest, yeah. like, uh, you know, all these requirements for caterers to have vegetarian options. Why don't you just jump to vegan directly and you would benefit more people? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, we tried that uh, and uh, we tried to push towards that. But unfortunately, there's a lot of pushback. And so we're trying to manage all that as well. So we will, we will definitely try to push more of the vegan stuff. So... Um, and I think right now we're at the point that we just want to ensure all these food operators do understand and appreciate the difference. Because one of my own personal experience, the most horrible one to date so far <laughs> was on, uh, maybe I should not mention, but uh, our national carrier, <laughs> our national carrier. <laughs> so I was in this airline and I requested specifically for a vegan meal <laughs> or, or, okay, I think it was even gluten-free. And unfortunately, they they served us bread, and it was normal <laughs> bread. It was obviously normal bread, and on top of that, I think it was egg sandwich. <laughs> so, oh my god! So it's like, uh, uh, and when I asked them, they said, "Huh? Oh, I mm, okay. Let me see what I can get." And they got me a juice, fruit juice, and that was the best that they could do at the time. So I guess, um, I guess for the normal Malaysian. 
not many can identify and differentiate all these different um, dietary patterns and dietary differences. So I think uh, we do need to do a lot more work, not just the dietary part for allergens as well and all that, but for, for MVS, we'll be focusing more on the vegetarian and the vegan uh, parts of it, definitely. Yeah, there needs to be more education on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, do, but, sorry, Davina, do you... Yeah. Oh, sorry. oh, sorry. Do you want to continue, Faisal? Yeah, but thank you, Rana. But yeah, if you have any, if you face any of those challenges, do give us the feedback and we'll try to address them as well. Because the enforcement part hasn't been there yet. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Davida? Yeah, thank you. Um, so regarding the student situation as well, I think there needs to be a sustainable, a sustainable framework for vendors to be able to continuously make a profit from selling uh, plant-based vegan food as well. And I think the issue is also brand association, especially with the uh, with the youth. So I had a talk with this um, international school headmaster a few years ago. We were in a discussion to try and implement uh, a fully vegan lunch spread for them uh, for every single meal time. Uh, but one issue was the resources because it was just me and I had brought on another plant-based caterer with me at the time. I don't know where he's, I don't know what's happened to him though. It's the cow, it's cow, cow, veg. I don't know what's happened to them. But anyway, so both of us made this. Um, no longer in business, this, unfortunately. So both of us got right. together and spoke to the headmaster again, like, okay, this is what we can offer. Um, the price point is to make it sustainable for everybody and healthy for the kids is like 12 ringgit per meal. And the headmaster said, it's not very, it's not very doable because right now the not only the kids but also the parents are going to complain about how expensive that is because they're they're getting um a piece of chicken thigh uh, rice and vegetables from a mama across the street for about nine bucks but the kids are more than willing during break time to go across the street and buy a frappuccino for 15 ringgit because of the brand association of being hip because they hang out at starbucks so we have to find a way to make veganism hip and happening and sexy. Yeah, that's exactly. the only way I love that. the kids. <laughs> I think that's, yeah. a, that's a good message to end on. Like, yeah, make <laughs> veganism hip. <laughs> yeah. And also, like, I guess the whole idea of, like, knowing the why first and then the how will follow. I think I like mm, that, the yeah. main message. Yeah. So, I mean, and, like, if I could add, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. if I could to Ravi's question. Uh, uh, yes, it's great if policies can come into place so universities have vegan options. Uh, but meantime, it might take a while. So why not just learn to cook? And you know that you can make affordable vegan options at home or in your you know university hostel. And yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I guess if yeah, I think that's good advice right now. Yeah. <laughs> the rice, the humble rice way. cooker can still do it. Yeah, uh, one, pot, one pot rice cooker. <laughs> if the students are allowed to cook inside their dorms, yeah, though, uh, that's a big issue. I, I've been told by students here also. Uh, my my they university, if they didn't, my university didn't allow huh? it, but I still did it anyways. <laughs> when there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> We're a trailblazer. Thank, thank you all. Oh my god. Okay, we're gonna like. I think we've stretched a bit too long. Thanks for like, being patient with us, everyone.